It's been a tough year during the pandemic lockdowns for farmers and crofters across Scotland. They've been unable to meet up on farm visits and share knowledge. These visits provided a valuable opportunity for farmers to share best practice and offer ideas for improving business performance. Now, as the world has moved online, farmers and crofters the length and breadth of Scotland are opening their farm gates to share knowledge and information in a new and exciting way. Throughout 2021, FAS TV will be highlighting the changes farmers and crofters have made to their operation. Coming up on this episode of FAS TV, we look at protecting soil managing a dairy grazing system, and there's also our regular crop update. Lambing is a busy time of year. With large numbers of sheep and a big team of staff, communication is key at King's Arms to ensure everything goes smoothly. I'm Andrew McLean, I've been farm manager here at the King's Arms uh, for 26 years. Uh, King's Arms is situated in Ballantry, right in the shore, so we're pretty fortunate with some good dry ground. Um, we have about 1,400 ewes to lamb uh, and 200 cows, mostly dairy bred, but we do have some pedigree Charlies, which we breed some bulls and sell, sell some bulls off farm. Lambing here starts at the end of February, so we start with the main flock of ewes and move on to the hogs. How many staff have you got and where, where do they come from? We have two full-time staff, uh, myself and Andrew Nutt. I'm based here at the King's Arms, Andrew's at South Gaffer. Um, we do run it all as one unit, uh, so we work together most of the time. My son's self-employed, um, he's got his own wee contracting business, so if we're busy he gives us a hand. Lambing time, we usually bring in for three weeks, the three busiest weeks, we have a lammer for through the day, a lammer at night, and another couple of staff, which are local guys that just, farmer's son, the other chaps just to see it here for the first time this year. He's local as well, so it's quite good, and my wife, she takes her, <laughs> her holidays for the dispensary for a week and a half or two weeks to do the market. So it's really quite a tight team and we all work well together. Um, Robert, he comes down, the boss, he comes down and gives a hand out at lambing time as well when they're taking sheep out to the field and things like that. So it's a, a team effort. Everybody has to work together. How important is strong communication at this time of, of year? You need to speak to one another. There's a lot happening in this shed. I mean, we're working on up to 124 hours. Sometimes we have had more. So if you have a hundred lambing and they're in single panes, you really need to communicate. So what we do in the sheep shed here, as you've probably seen, everything gets painted up. My wife marks everything in the morning, so she's round every pane looking in it, and then in the afternoon she'll go back round. We do all the lambs' navels with iodine and surgical spirits. So in the afternoon, Fiona goes round and does them again. We double, double what we call double dipping. Um, so she's every lamb that's been put in a pain is checked in the afternoon again. So that's it filled. Make sure it's a suck. And if there's anything needing topped up or a hand to suck or anything like that, it's picked up. Marking the pens is key to communication on the farm, as Andrew explains. Well, this is a pen of singles. Um, so these ewes here have all been cross fostered. So the first ewe here was. Born, the lamb was born at 12 o'clock on the 3rd and we twinned another lamb onto her. So she's now got her own lamb plus one. Uh, the next pen was born on the 3rd at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We took her lamb off her and gave her two new lambs. So she's got twin on two. And then the third pen here was born at 11 o'clock on the 3rd and she's also got two twinned on. But there's also been a wee problem with her either not taking them or a weaker lamb, so it's got check written in the pen. So straight away reading the pen, we know exactly what's in the pens and a wee bit of explanation of what they are. 
Effective communication at Lamming is essential to allow the Lamming team to work together effectively. Inadequate communication can cause time and efforts to be wasted and mistakes to be made. Changeover in the morning between, between Lammers happens at 6 o'clock. So I come out about half past five and speak to Will, who's been here all night, and find out what's been happening. John comes in about six, and then we, we go round and we start caking all the ewes in the passage and in the single panes. So that's another check. So we're all going round and you're checking again. As you go round, if there's maybe one that has helped through the night to have a suck or anything like that, or he's not sure about, it's talked about in the way around as we feed everything. So basically when we get to the end of the shed, if there's been any problems or anything that's actually lambing on the change over time, they've seen it. Uh, at night, slightly different. We're all fed by the time Wall comes in. So John and him usually just have a wander around the shed and they'll just check everything that's going on and update one another on what's going on. And just basically that, they just talk to one another. For useful tips and tricks on better communication, visit the FAS website, faz.scot. Soil compaction as a result of incorrect tyre pressures for the task at hand can contribute to significant yield losses. At Castleton Farm in North Berwick, spending time to achieve the optimum low tyre pressure for fieldwork is a key component in farmer Stuart McNichol's soil protection strategy. Stuart runs a single Case Puma 165 tractor and by closely monitoring his tyre pressure has protected his soils at minimal extra cost. Optimum tyre pressures are altered based on the task and load distribution on axles. The benefits include reduced damage to the soil, reduced yield losses and more consistency during drilling. This is a two-year-old tractor and when I was looking to spec it for tyres I decided to go for 650 wide tyres and my reason for that is I've still got a plough. You cannot use 710 tyres with a plough. I have a set of narrow row crop tyres which are the same height as these ones uh, for when I'm spraying or fertiliser in this. These tyres obviously we can vary the pressures uh, for the different equipment that we have on you must remember that whatever you've got on the back, you may have to put weight on the front. So with this sprayer setup, I have a tonne and a half, 1,500 kilos sitting at the front to keep my sprayer tank that's got 2,000 litres in the back. New advancements in tyre technology and design allow single tyres to be run at lower pressure without damaging the tyre wall. On this tractor, we have a set of 600 wide tyres at the front and a set of 650 tyres at the back. I run different tyre pressures for different implements. So for my trailer, my grain trailer, for example, I will be running 20 PSI in the back and 18 PSI in the front. But if I'm rolling or if I'm using my grain drill, I'll be 10 PSI in the back and 10 PSI in the front. Tractor wheelings damage our soils. At drilling, there can be as much as a 15% reduction in yield compared to an untrafficked area. Soil compaction is where the soil is being compressed down and it becomes hard packed. So when the roots, whatever crop you've sown in, and if those roots have to go down to get moisture and have to find all the nutrients, they can't get through that compacted area. So when I go to increase or decrease my tyre pressures, uh, I use a spanner and I actually take the nipple completely out so the air is rushing out the tyre and I count, as I've learnt, to about 20 seconds, put it back in, uh, screw it back up and then I use um, 
my air compressor that's on the tractor. And someone might go, what air compressor is that? Well, if you've got a tractor with air brakes, you've got an air compressor. So we put a line, an air line into the um, air compressor, the air brakes on the back, the red line. And then we use, obviously, tire gauge. Depending on what implement you have on, if you have lower tire pressures, you have to reduce your road speed. But it may be that we have a, a machine that's going a distance where you may then decide we'll run with a higher pressure on the tire. And then when we get to the field, what we can do is we can actually lower the tire pressure. And traditionally, we've always looked at three lugs on the ground. Well, we go at four lugs on the ground. And what that is doing, that's putting a huge footprint 650 wide by also the distance uh, front to back. That's a huge footprint that you're putting down. And that is the stop to try and reduce our soil compaction, to try and stop us having to use other cultivations to try and rip that uh, soil compaction out that potentially shouldn't have been there in the first place. Mark is an agri-consultant. He believes the benefits of reducing compaction can be significant. Obviously tractors um, have various uh, operations to perform and use different types of equipment and the weight transfer of those uh, different types of equipment is different. Uh, and so it's important um, from a soils point of view that um, uh, tractors are balanced accordingly um, so that the weight on the back of the tractor is transferred equally to the front so we get downward pressure on all four wheels on both axles. I think um, the move towards uh, perhaps min-till uh, and the move away from ploughing prior to drilling means that you are moving tractors over ground that has been less disturbed. It's more important therefore that when you are driving over the ground with those machines that can often weigh in excess of 15 tonnes, you are trying to minimise the amount of damage that, and, the, and the impression that the tyre is leaving within that soil horizon before the drill quarters go over. And you're only putting seed in up to, say, um, probably no more than half an inch in depth in instances. So the reason why we like to try and um, minimise the, uh, the downward pressure is to and try and get a greater uniformity of crop once drilled. The reason for moving to min till is to reduce the weedings in the ground and although Stuart hasn't gone as far as controlled traffic farming where you're trying to get down to about 20 to 25 percent of the ground being trafficked, he's making considerable aims to reduce the compaction where he is traveling by adjusting the pressures. So a high flexion tire will have a stronger sidewall that will enable you to deflate the tyre down to probably as low as 8 psi without there being a danger of the tyre coming off the rim. So it's really being able to um, keep the tyre on the rim at very low pressures. Achieving the correct um, tyre calibration is really a matter of trial and error with your local dealer uh, who supplied you with the tyres. It'll depend on the uh, flexible characteristics of the tyre wall and also the weight balance with the implements you're using. So it'll, it'll vary according to your make of tractor, your make of tyre and, and what, what operations you're doing. My three key points to look after compaction is to take a spade into a field to see if you've got compaction. I would then look at the machinery that you have and what compaction they potentially could be having and then I'd look at your tyres to see how you can alleviate that compaction by reducing your tyre pressures. Last time we visited Ochnotroch, we looked at their block carving system. This time we're looking at the Baird's grazing system. Raised grass has long been recognised as the cheapest way to feed cows. 
Sitting at around 200 metres above sea level and with an average rainfall of over 900 millimetres, the management of the 19 paddock rotational grazing system at Ochnotroch has to be good. So basically our grazing system is we get out the grass as, as soon as we can. Um, we try and take as much milk from forage as we can. Uh, we have the farm is split in two halves here, pretty much down that fence line there. So we're working on A, B and back to A system. Unusually, Ochnotroch is combining rotational grazing with robotic milking, which has presented some challenges and benefits. We well, were told you would end up with two and a half cows standing waiting the gate open and a switching and you this will be ringing and this will know what and it worked an absolute treat. Uh, couldn't it have gone any better. The biggest issue I had was actually cows grazing too far down. They were supposed to get it three thousand or three kilos or three thousand kilos of dry matter and come out at fifteen hundred and quite often they were coming out at thirteen hundred. They were just stay there and graze away and I thought I thought as well they would come looking for cake no they just grazed away and it couldn't have worked any better the biggest issue I had with starting the robots was working out how small paddocks to give them to try and get those three milkings a day we were giving them too much to start with and then we were actually to reset the robots because they were coming through just before they were going to get milked and then going to the next paddock and coming back in running milk. So we, we reset the robots to try and milk them, make sure everything got milked on its way through, and that made a difference as well. They were set up for grazing when we were milking. They had the top half in the morning and the bottom half in the afternoon, so they were all set up in day paddocks. Um, and now they're kind of two day worth paddocks, so we've got much more time to get through the grazing than we did before. Um, obviously with the AB system it takes a bit longer, or the AB system it takes a bit longer to um, get through the grass, so grass is keeping ahead of cows much quicker, uh, much better. Um, and cows are happier because there's always more grass, they're always going in above the 3,000. We've, we've kind of struggled to get in at the 3,000 last year, um, so they've always got tons of grass in front of them. Uh, so it's improved our grazing system as well, just and they're more intensively dunging, so hopefully the organic matter and the whole soil quality will increase as well. Measuring grass is key to the system. We've been a member of Grasscheck for the last two years and we've got one year to go. Uh, it was our neighbour mentioned it to us that the, this opportunity was coming up, so we applied for it at that point. We measure the grass once a week, um, every Tuesday, and we put those measurements into Agrinet, and then from there they take a database of your farm individually over the last two years in Scotland and then over the UK. Um, and from there we also take, every second Tuesday, I take a sample of the paddock that the cows are going into next. And then that goes away and gets analysed for dry matter, protein, and it enables us to make sure our, our grass quality is up to standard as well because that's one way that you keep cows grazing is having good quality grasses. Um, so we actually had to reseed a field because of this. We were able to pinpoint that that was a weakness to us. So we, we reseeded last year uh, and it made a big difference to this year's or last year's grazing. The robots start up last year were slightly later getting out than we should have been. We ended up taking 20 acres of first cut out of paddocks because we just didn't get out quick enough and the grass got away from us and then later in the year we actually took another three paddocks out for bales uh, just because the grass just grew. We have cow tracks pretty much to all the paddocks. Additional infrastructure has been added over time. This doubles as the turbine road <laughs> which was ideal. Uh, We've got a dirt road goes the other way and we've got a concrete sleeper road that's every now everything's covered in the turf. Makes a massive difference to cows speed the walk. Pre-mowing is used as a management tool. Pre-mow everything, um, just kind of about halfway around the second rotation, grass just starts to shoot and we'll start at that point and go around and just pre-mow everything in front of the cows that time. And then generally that's it, unless it's needing taken out for bales. 
Fertiliser is applied little and often. Every time the cows come out, the fields split, is fertilised before they go back in it again. On the next visit to Ochnotroch, we'll look at their multi-cut silage system. I'm Fiona Burnett from SRUC's Crop Protection Team and we're here on SRUC's Bog Hall Farm where we run many of our arable trials. And the farm is really typical of many of the issues that are out there in arable crops this year. So we've experienced that very wet winter uh, and the snow cover uh, that sat over crops for much of the early part of this year. So conditions on farm beginning to improve quite quickly and fertiliser getting out there onto crops. Uh, spring barley seed arriving on farm as well. So what we want to start thinking about with this programme is how we go through the year adjusting the crop protection inputs to the actual risks that we're experiencing on farm and looking at the disease levels and adjusting our, our inputs accordingly. So at this time of year it's really crucial just to get out and look at crops, inspect them and see what disease is there and from that adjust your, your crop protection inputs. So, for example, the winter barley plot that I'm beside just now has really quite high levels of rhynchosporium building up. So it is an example of a, of a crop or a trial where you would actually wish to get in early um, and perhaps do an early clean-up of the rhynchosporium um, because there's really quite a lot there. It's really on all, even the youngest uh, leaves there. For other crops, uh, perhaps slightly later drilled or more resistant, you could afford to leave it until the T1 proper and start your programmes at stem extension uh, and target it uh, at that time. Disease pressure in winter wheat crops this year is still generally quite low, although we've got some reports of yellow rust in wheat crops around coastal regions. It's still relatively unusual. And yellow rust is an example of a disease which is a, a driver of very early sprays, of, of T0 sprays. But in the main, we're thinking about treating wheats at the main T1 timing. And the main drivers of septoria in our wheat crops are variety and sow date. And at the minute, it's sow date that's really the biggest uh, factor in how much septoria we're seeing in, in crops. So the early drilled crops showing more. But as we go through the season, the varietal resistance becomes more and more important and really starts to damp down the septoria levels in the crops that carry better resistance. So looking at this uh, winter wheat crop, it's fairly thin, uh, relatively late sown, so disease pressure is still quite low. Um, there's no sign of yellow rust in this crop, so this is an example of one that doesn't need early T0 uh, fungicides. We have a very small amount of septoria on these older leaves, which is, again, relatively normal for this age and stage of the crop. So this is one that we would just monitor, um, see how disease levels build, and then tailor our inputs uh, once we get closer to the, the stem extension and the T1 timings. Also drape this year and this time of year, the, the main feature this year has really been just what a rough time they've had over the winter. Uh, we've lost quite a lot of, of leaf tissue um, to frost and snow uh, and one of the main issues ha has been pigeon damage and the site here at Bog Hall Farm is kind of typical of that. Maybe the, the fortunate thing is that it's been relatively evenly grazed by pigeons. But what we're really looking at in the, the crop at this time of year is the amount of light leaf spot that's there which will be a driver of the crop protection uh, fungicides that we put on as the crop begins to extend. And the light leaf spot around the country at the moment is, is relatively low. The pressure is not particularly high this year. But one of the things to think about is how we can mix and alternate the chemistry. So trying to think of chemistry for the welly boot sprays, the, those stem extension light leaf spot sprays that's different to the chemistry that we might be applying uh, at the flowering sprays uh, where we're managing sclerotinia. And that's all for this episode of Fast TV. Next time. The value of colostrum. When to intervene at carving. And EFA cover crops.
for more information on any of our stories, go online to faz.scott. <laughs>